Hey everyone. In this video, I wanted to dive into roughly your first hour with GitHub Copilot. I've been using it for a while now. And I think one of the key things about nearly every technology, including GitHub Copilot, is you can get a massive amount of the productivity gains from knowing a small percentage of the features. Now, obviously the more features you know, the greater that becomes, but there's always this 80-20 kind of rule. And I think you can get a vast amount of benefit just from knowing a few key things. So it's those few key things I'm going to really focus on and talk about in this video. Now, when I think about GitHub Copilot, the key point is, so if we kind of draw out what we're doing, it is your partner. So I think of it as your AI dev partner. Often you might work with maybe a senior dev who you bounce ideas off, you communicate with, and that's the whole point. It's not someone who just does the job for you, but it's someone you can talk to, you can iterate with, get ideas from, ask for suggestions from. And that is the key point around what his GitHub Copilot. It's doing those same things for you. Now, if we take a step back and think, well, what exactly is there for this GitHub Copilot? How does it maybe vary from other things? And we always talk about the idea of a large language model, hence why I'm wearing this t-shirt. So we can always think about, we have a large language model and we, we draw this neural network. And the whole point of this neural network is you have all these different neurons connecting and they have a strength of connection. You hear about these weights and biases that determine how strong the connections are between these different neurons. You'll hear them called parameters as well. And the way this works is there was a huge amount of data. So vast amounts of knowledge was used to train the large language model, which tweaks all the parameters, those weights and biases, it, it changes the relative strengths on them. Now, as part of that training of the modern large language models, it also learns vast amounts of information about the world, but it also learns about pretty much every programming language that exists in the world. And then once it's been programmed, what we can then do is we give it some prompt. So I can say, okay, hey, here's my prompt that I'm requesting. And I send it into the large language model, which performs an inference. And what this is doing is it's predicting from a probability distribution, the next most probable token. And then the next one and the next one until the next most probable token is an end of sequence token and its work is done. And so it goes through all of this until I get a response. So it's one token at a time, which could be a word or part of word or a symbol. And then I get that result from me. Now, early on for nat natural language to code, there were specific large language models, neural networks. For example, you may have heard of Codex. But then with the advancements of the more foundational models, then it, it switched to sort of GPT-3.5 Turbo, now 4, and I think that iteration will just continue using the newer and newer versions of the model. Now, when we think about the quality of that inference that I just referred to, the quality is going to be based in large part on the prompt. So I just did the word prompt. But the reality is, well, there's the bit maybe the user types in. There's a piece that the system may add to that. So there's the bit the user gives, but then the system, whatever application I'm interacting with, it may add instructions. You're an AI assistant. Uh, you want to be very polite. It may also add things like context. Hey, here's a piece of code. Here's a piece of data. You'll hear about retrieval augmented generation. It was trained, remember, on this certain body of knowledge. That's pre-trained knowledge it can leverage, but it doesn't know my code. It doesn't know my data. So I might add in additional context so it can know what we're trying to work with. 
Sometimes we'll give it examples of types of interactions. You'll hear about one shot and few shot. So it might say, hey, if you ask this, this is how you may respond. And it, it will give examples of that. So the higher the quality the prompt, generally the better quality the response will be. And this is an important part to start to understand that you might say when we talk about GitHub Copilot, when well, it's using a regular foundational large language model, the GPT models, but it's going to give me a very different response than if I was just to type that in Microsoft Copilot in a browser or on a Windows machine, because there are other things that are going on as well. And I wanted to just talk about those foundational things. So if we look at, well, what is our experience and how are we interacting with these? We're working in our integrated development environment. Now, there are many different ones supported, but I can imagine, okay, well, I'm working in my IDE. Now, within my IDE, I might have various tabs. I'm working on a certain tab, but there's other tabs as well. I've got my code, hopefully it's a bit better than this code. I'm working on a certain section of that code. And now I want to integrate with GitHub Copilot. Now I can think about maybe the tab I'm working on, maybe the tabs near it, maybe the selection of code. That's all context that would matter. Maybe if I'm using chat, the chat history. So I can think about, well, yes, there's a prompt that I'm going to give it, but then there's also, there's the context of what I'm working on and then that prompt. So that information that is sent, and this is all part of now the GitHub Copilot because I'm adding an extension into my integrated development environment. Now the context of my prompt, this is gonna get transmitted, encrypted using TLS, so we talk about HTTPS. This then gets sent to the GitHub Copilot proxy. Now this proxy is doing a number of different things for me. For example, one of the first things it's going to do is it's going to check for toxicity. Is there toxic language? I, it's enforcing responsible AI. So it's looking for that toxicity. It's also, if I'm using the chat, well, am I asking it for something that isn't code related? Its job is to help you with code. It's your software development partner. It doesn't want to give you cookie recipes. So it's checking for, is this actually related to code? Am I trying to do something bad? Am I trying to hijack? Am I trying to do some jailbreak on the system? If I'm doing any of those things, well, it's just going to drop it. It's not going to let me proceed with those things. It's going to terminate that. But assuming it's not doing any of that, well, now it's going to go. And I talked about all these different elements of the prompt. Well, it's going to go and create that meta prompt that will actually get sent to the large language model that based on the request I'm doing, the context is going to help construct the very best quality prompt that it can now go and take all of that, construct the prompt, and yes, now it can send it into the large language model. It then goes to the large language model. We talked about how it's going to generate the response. And then once again, now that response goes to that proxy. And once again, it's going to check for things like toxicity. Is there something bad has snuck into there? It's going to look at the quality of the code it's generating. It's checking for obvious bugs. It might remove elements that contain unique identifiers like email addresses or credentials. It's going to look for duplicate detection. It's going to apply security filters. So I might think of very common security vulnerabilities. It's going to get rid of that uh, cross-site scripting, SQL injection. It's looking for those things. And then of course, it also can check for public code use. Now, depending on my organization, I may have very strict controls over the use of public code within my application. And as an organization, I can configure if that's just blocked, if attention is drawn to it. Even as an individual via my profile in the Copilot section, I can control how I want to do that. 
And then once it goes through all of those different things, only then, through the extension, does it become a response within my environment. So that's all the different things that GitHub Copilot is doing. So it's not just I type sync in it's giving it to a large language model to get an inference. It's actually doing a whole lot of other things about responsible AI, creating that meta prompt, give, maybe giving examples on the types of interactions I'm doing. So I get the very highest quality of experience. So that's fantastic. Sounds good. How do I, do I get this? How do I get this programming AI partner? So there's a number of things that I require in able to leverage this. The first one is, so step one, is I need a GitHub account. That's obviously fairly obvious, but I have to have a GitHub account and that's free. Then what I have to do is I have to add a GitHub Copilot license. Now that license is probably gonna come from your organization. Now there are different licenses, but even organizations can give this to you, but even as an individual, I can purchase this as well. So if I was to look, for example, at different options, there's individual, there's Copilot Business, there's Copilot Enterprise, they have different price points for those. But I can go and see what's stored, for example, conversations tailored to your organization's repositories. So it can actually go and add in additional code if I'm using that enterprise level. Code completion options, inline chat prompt suggestions, public code filters, notice it's there for all of them. Data excluded by training. So this is an important one. So for the so those business ones, nothing is ever used. Your code is never used for the training, but maybe your prompts might be. So for the individual, it's not excluded by default. If you go and look at the trust center, it does talk about security. It talks about the privacy elements. It talks about how does GitHub use the Copilot data. And it goes through a lot of details so you know exactly how it is and it isn't, what you can use. So here it talks about business and enterprise. Is it trained? Nope, never for those elements. So you do have control about what it's doing and how it's using uh, those various elements. You can go and check, and I've got the links to this in the documentation. So I have to have a license. Once I have the license, well now I have to go and add the extensions to there. So I talked about the extension before, but the reality is there's actually two extensions. There is a base extension, and one of the most common keystrokes you'll use is the control, or if it's Mac, I think it's command, plus I. And that will bring up this little interactive ability to go and start interacting with the GitHub Copilot. So there's the base, and then there's also the chat, which is the control, command, if you're Mac, shift, and I. But also there's little icons, and we're gonna go through detail of all of this, but I need to install those extensions. Now, if I was to jump over for a second to our code editor, so what we'll be doing is we're going over to extensions. And what we're looking for here is, if I can type my keyboards over here, GitHub Copilot, and we'll see there's two. So I wanna install both of these extensions. So GitHub Copilot and GitHub Copilot Chat. So I'm gonna have those installed on my machine. Once I've installed these, now all I'm gonna to have to do is sign in. So we'll actually see if I look at my sign in, we can see I've signed in with my handle for the GitHub and the GitHub Copilot chat. So I have to then go and sign in to complete that process. So we install the extensions and then for that GitHub account, which we added the license to, with those extensions, I just have to step four, sign in. And that's it. So I've now done that section of everything I have to do and I'm ready now to start using it. Woohoo. And so let's actually dive in to using these in the environment. Now I'm just 
in an area right here, I'll go back to the files area into my scratch folder. Now, the first thing you are gonna see is down here in the bottom, you will see this little GitHub Copilot icon. Now it should show status is ready. If I click it, notice here at the top, my status is ready. From here, I could go and open a GitHub Copilot chat. I can open various panels. I can go and edit a whole number of different settings that are available. I can help control the code completion interactions. So I take a moment, you can go and look at those things and see all the different uh, settings that apply and I can leverage in the environment. Now, one thing I do wanna stress here is there's a, a whole set of best practices when I deal with large language models. And the same things will apply here. This isn't any different. I wanna think about having short, simple, specific prompts. Remember, it is my partner. I cannot say, hey, go and create me a Minecraft clone. It's gonna be like, I can't do that. But instead, break it down to specific aspects of what I need. It can help you create a function. It can help give you suggestions. It can help refactor my code. It can help set up a, a framework from what I want to do. And so maybe the best thing is we could start playing around and seeing some of this in action. So what I'm gonna do initially is let's just go and create a new file. So I'm gonna create a new file. And I'm just gonna call it multiply.ps1. So I'm gonna do PowerShell. Now again, it knows pretty much every language that exists based on all the data it was trained on. So I could just start off doing it. Notice actually you've got these little sparkly things. This is part of the GitHub Copilot. But if I just do a comment, so if I were say function to multiply to numbers and return the result, push enter. Now notice what straight away it's doing is it's part of the GitHub, I've got my little sparkles. It's giving me a suggestion. Function multiply dollar $A, dollar $B, and it returns times in them together. Now at this point, let's just do that again. I could just do tab and accept it. So now I have that code available to me. I can ask it to do other things. I might say uh, test cases, enter. And now it's giving me some examples of a test. Okay, right host five times five is equals to multiply. It's showing me some things I could do with that. Uh, we do the same thing. So let's open another test file. This time we'll do a JavaScript. So we do a new file, multiply.js. And we could do exactly the same idea. Uh, function to multiply two numbers. Uh, that's not great, I don't love that one. Now sometimes you'll get options, it would show you, but I'll just do enter anyway, sorry, tab, and then I'll just wait, and now it's showing me the rest of it, so I'll just tab again. So I'm not actually doing anything, it's helping me as I go, it's suggesting the next thing and the next thing that I can do. And once again, I could do things like test cases, so I could do, hey, uh, test cases, and once again, it's given me some options I could do there. I could maybe ask it to do some other stuff. So let's select this bit of code right here. Now straight away, I could right click on it. Now if you look at the right click, I have a co-pilot menu and there's some options. Notice I have things like, hey, explain this, fix it, generate docs, generate tests. So there are options I can do. I could also, notice it's got a little icon here, show code actions. I could modify it using Copilot, surround it with different things. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select this and I'm gonna push Control and I. So I'm using Control I. This would be Command I if I was on Macintosh. And from here, I could ask it to do something else. In my case, I'm gonna say, add validation that inputs are numbers. So this is sending it to the GitHub Copilot. I push enter and it's adding in some new code. You can see it just type this in. 
And if I want that, I can just say accept. Or I could discard it. Or I could say, look, just rerun it, see what else. But I'll just say, hey, I'll accept that. So now it's added in some new code for me. So this just playing around and starting to see some of the stuff it can do. But let's, let's dive into some more examples about this. So let's once again, we'll just do a comment. So function to add two numbers. And if I push enter, now notice it's giving me the suggestion. Now, before I do anything, if I just hover over it, it brings up this bar. Now, sometimes I will have multiple suggestions here and I can iterate forward and back through them with these arrows. I could also use the Alt and Square bracket keys to move back and forth through them as well. I could accept the entire suggestion. I could accept just a particular word so I can do parts of it. Now my suggestion has gone. I could go back up like I did before and push enter, but if you do Alt and the backslash, it will bring up my suggestion again. So that was Alt and the backslash key. And now it's showing it once again, I have my options available. I could do tab, I could do accept, I could do accept word, you have the three little dots, I could accept a line, I could show the completions panel. So I could select this, and now it's once again showing me all the different options. And typically this will show me some more. So suggestion one, it's got some test cases in there. Suggestion two, suggestion three, and I can pick accept to put in one of these various options that we have here. Now I can just close that down. So that is really useful. Another thing I can do apart from just the function, I could just start typing it. So I might write function add, and notice already it's suggesting a whole bunch of things. Okay, function add because of stuff it's seen and it's predicting based on the context. So we can see there's a context of multiply. So hey, add, is probably going to be a very common thing you might want to do. So I could just hit tab and get all of that added in for me. So it's really helping me from a code completion perspective. Now, additionally, what about getting some help with what I'm doing? So here, I'm just going to select a bunch of code. And from here, if I do control I, or command I on the Macintosh, which we saw before, I can ask it to do something. But notice it's also saying, well, forward slash, there's a list of core commands. I can ask it to document. I can ask it to explain. I can ask it to fix. I can ask it to generate tests for the things I would do it. So I could say, well, explain this to me. Just push enter. And the selected code is now giving me an explanation of what it's doing within here. And I can ask it to actually read it out to me as well using this little icon. So it's a great way. And again, I could view it in the chat. I could configure inline chat. There's different options I have around this. But again, it can help me very quickly document the code, fix the code, uh, create tests for the code explain to me what it's doing. And all of these commands I'm doing here, I'm showing it in VS Code, but the same things would work in Visual Studio, other IDEs. And if I can't remember the control I, that's fine. If I just select the code and right click, again, you have the Copilot menu, explain this, fix this, generate docs, generate tests you have those same things available. Add selection to chat, add a file to chat. I can still go and interact. So that, that inline interaction with the GitHub Copilot is really powerful. It can help you do huge numbers of things. Now let's talk about the chat option. Remember we installed two extensions. So the other thing I have over here is this little chat. And that's that more interactive, just talking with it as it's my AI programming partner. So I can click the little chat icon. Now it's going to open up my chat window. I could show a history of chats. 
I could open a chat in a new window, whatever I want to do here. The other thing I can do is if I do Control Shift I, it brings up that Copilot window chat here for a quick chat. So this lets me do a, a quick chat interacting just with that Control Shift I. And from here, I can just interact in a number of different ways. Let's bring up that chat window. I can ask it stuff. So what is the bulk head pattern? I'm working with my partner today. It's going to help me do various things. I could ask, hey, what pattern could I use to stop cascading failures? Oh, don't want that over there. I could say, hey, um, create a new uh, C sharp application. Create a new C sharp file with function uh, to multiply two numbers. So now it's talking me through, okay, well, this is what it would look like, explaining what it's doing. And I could then go take that code and go and put it in a file that I create. Imagine for a second, I'm just over here and I'm working on this file. So I'm in my workspace, I'm doing something. Within the Copilot chat, I can reference it. So one of the things we have, if I type there just a hash symbol for a second, you'll see there's options. Hey, the current editor, the file, the selection I have, the terminal last command, terminal selection, VS Code API. But I could just reference, for example, the editor. So I might say, hey, look, explain what's in the editor. So now it's going to look at what is the current selected tab and then walk through and explain the code that is currently in that editor. But I had all those different options available. Now, this is currently the chat is just over here. It's in my bar. I can move between my various things. I may not want it here. I may want it docked because I use it so often. So one of the nice things I can do is I could actually put it in the secondary sidebar. So if I go to view and appearance and I have my secondary sidebar option here. So if I select that, there's my secondary button. There's nothing there. I can then click on the chat and drag it over and then release. So now my chat will come be available in my secondary sidebar all the time. So it just makes it maybe more easier to use. And if I want to put it back, I just grab the icon at the top again. I'm going to click it, hold it down and drag it back to the other menu. And now it's back over here in my core menu. So that might be useful just for how I intend to use this. We do also have the little sparkly quick actions. So once again, if I just select something, notice here it's actually got my little sparkle, but it's in addition to other things as well. But if I click that, then we have some, in this case, the sparkly is modify using Copilot. So I can use it to come and help. There might be quick fixes there, for example. Um, let's start a new file. And we do junk.python. So we have to create a Python file. And I will just type printf hello world. There we go. Now. If I notice it's actually complaining, it's not happy about this at all. But notice I've got some sparklies up here. If I go to this line right here, I've got sparklies. And notice I have fix using Copilot and explain using Copilot. So if I select the fix using Copilot, to fix the error printf is not defined, you can replace printf with the print function. Yep, that sounds like a good idea. Now, this is a super simple, silly example, but you get the idea. It helps me solve what I'm doing. And when I talked about those forward slash commands, if I do it from the chat window, I actually have a bunch of other ones. 
You'll see there's things like new, new notebooks, help. There's different things I can ask it to do. I can also interact with the terminal, with VS Code, with the workspace. So the VS Code would let me ask it questions about Visual Studio Code. So I might say, hey, VS Code, how do I change to a light theme? So now it's going through and it will help me in my interactions in this case, in this IDE, about things with VS Code. If I requested that of the terminal, well then it would maybe help me things in the terminal. So it's, hey, how I could go and change the theme. But I might ask it, well, hey, terminal, how do I create an environment variable? And now it's gonna go and interact with that and it's solving that problem. So there's different things I can interact with to get help in a number of different ways. So with all of that, I thought it would be fun to finish with some more powerful examples. And a huge actually thank you to GitHub Copilot team for these because they actually gave me some sample files so I could show uh, some much, much cooler stuff. So here, I'm looking at a, a more complicated file. And I'm just gonna ask in the chat, is there any redundant code? Remember my context is my currently opened tab. And it understands that. And it's checking. Yes, make the sound method in the animal class directly. If you want to write redundancy, make the code more flexible. You could override make sound in the dog and the cat. So it's given me ideas of what I can do to make this code more efficient. Cool. Okay. If I look at a different file, so this time I might say, okay, if I scroll and look around at my, um, actually that's the wrong file. Let's open up my seller controller file. There we go. And I'll go and look at this function here, this post seller. And I might look at this and be like, hmm, okay. What I actually want to do is can I refactor this code into multiple methods? So now it's going to break down this into these separate methods instead of this one great big, I could ask it to use a strategy pattern. So I could say, refactor this code into multiple methods using the strategy pattern. And then it will go and change that into matching what I've asked it to do. Again, it's my partner AI programmer. I could say, well, okay, well, what other patterns can I use? Again, it has context. The context is not just the tab. The context includes the chat history. So it then can start to give me other ideas and other patterns that I could leverage as part of this. I might look at a HTML file and I might say, okay, well, what are the performance implications of this code? So I'm going to see what it's doing here. And it's going through the code. It's even giving me refactored examples to solve the problems that it's finding. But it's going through and saying, well, you're making multiple network requests. Each call results in a separate network request to the API. I've got a blocking main thread. So there's a bunch of problems to it. And I could even ask it, well, obviously it's given me an answer here, but I could say, well, how can I fix the network request issue identified above? And now it will give me some refactored code that would help me solve that particular problem. And it explains what it's doing. Fantastic. I might use it to modernize stuff. So here I've got a, a really old uh, form. And I might say convert this form into a WPF app. And again, it knows the context, tells me what to do. And then it's giving me an example 
of leveraging that. And I could expand on that. Or maybe I like the style of what it was currently doing. And I could say, hey, I want to keep that using the style capturing of what it currently has. But you can start to see it really is there. It's not doing the whole job for you. That That's not its goal. The goal is not to just solve everything for you at all. That's not what it's trying to do. But its goal is absolutely trying to help you with whatever you are interacting with. That's what it's there for. And so hopefully that, that makes sense. My recommendation on how to use this would be start to use one thing at a time and make it part of your core muscle memory. So for example, I might think about, okay, I'm going to focus on control I or command I to quickly bring up this menu, to quickly ask it to interact and how to work with this. And then once that's a core part, I'll start to remember, well, I can just do a forward slash and there are these things to help me here. I might also get the chat up and running. Remember, I can do the control shift I to bring up the chat where I am, make that easier to access. And again, just start to work on leveraging those things. But those few core things will bring you a huge amount of productivity gain. So start small, make them a core part of your muscle memory and usage, part of your natural habit. And then you can start to work on more things and more things. So that that's really the goal around it. Um, I hope that was useful. Uh, enjoy uh, getting the most out of your GitHub Copilot. Thank you.